Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles, the Friday podcast all about your Kindle. I'm Len Edgerly. Today is February 23rd, 2018. Greetings from Cambridge, Massachusetts, our fair city, as Click and Clack the Tappet Brothers used to say on NPR's Car Talk Show. Darlene and I will return to Denver on Sunday morning in time to catch a performance of the hit musical Hamilton Wednesday at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. We waited in line, I think, five hours starting about 6 a.m. at 20 degree temperatures a few weeks ago, so this is coming up on the night. We'll probably find out it was well worth it. On Wednesday, I traveled by Skype to Frigid, Minnesota to visit with longtime listener John Aga, an avid reader and experienced Kindle user. My ideal Kindle would have uh, real buttons and would have audio support so that you could do immersion reading along with just straight reading. Also this week, more Amazon Go stores, another Whole Foods benefit for Prime members, Alexa learns how to play board games, what Amazon may be learning when we read our Kindles, and how you can record a message to note a milestone next week, the 500th episode of the Kindle Chronicles. I have dusted off my Google Voice phone number for the occasion, so if you'd like, you can leave a message at 617-807-0205, and I'll repeat that number at the end of the show. I hope to be able to use some of the messages that might come in as part of uh, next week's show, TKC 500. First up in news, enterprising sleuthing this week by Recode's Jason Del Rey uncovered indications that Amazon is planning this year to open as many as six cashierless Amazon Go stores. Del Rey quoted, quote, multiple people familiar with the company's plans for his story, which was published yesterday, February 22nd. His sources said the next Amazon Go stores are likely to open in Seattle, where the first one made its debut just over a month ago, and in Los Angeles. The story said it is not clear if Amazon will open Go stores in any other cities in 2018. Amazon has, the sources said, held serious talks with a billionaire developer about bringing a Go store to the Grove. That's an outdoor shopping area in LA. Amazon declined to comment on Del Rey's report, which I would classify as something stronger than a rumor, given this reporter's above average credibility and the details he was able to include in his story. Del Rey, in an update to the original story, noted that Amazon spent four years creating its Just Walk Out technology, that's what's behind the Go store, uh, and that they delayed the opening of the first store by about a year. Shoppers at the Go store, scan their phones on entering, grab the items they wish to buy off the shelves, and get charged the right amount on exiting without stopping at a cash register to pay. Sometimes they feel like they've been shoplifting, some of the people who tried it at first said. This may have been in earlier stories about the ghost stores, but Del Rey's piece yesterday was the first time I'd seen a parallel drawn between Just Walk Out technology for physical stores and Amazon innovations that revolutionized online shopping and delivery. Quote, Amazon is hoping that by making convenience store trips even faster, it will raise the bar for brick-and-mortar shopping in much the same way that Amazon Prime did for online shopping and delivery, he wrote. He also noted that a Go store in L.A. will be the latest example of how Amazon uses that city for early testing of products and services once they've gotten their start, sometimes in Seattle. Los Angeles was the first city Amazon expanded its Amazon Fresh grocery delivery to after testing and refining it for more than five years in Seattle. L.A. is also reported to be the launching pad for Amazon's new shipping service that would take on the likes of UPS and FedEx. I like how Del Rey spots patterns in past Amazon rollouts, and I think another one can be seen in comparing the expansion of the Amazon bookstores to Amazon Fresh and other services. There is a long period of perfecting the innovation, then trying it in one location for an extended shakedown cruise, and then gradually accelerating rollout across the country and then the world. 
Uh, next in news, I was pleased to learn this week of an expanded benefit that I now have at Whole Foods. In a joint release February 20th, Amazon and Whole Foods announced that Amazon Rewards Visa card members, that's through Chase, uh, who are also Prime members, will earn 5% back when they shop at Whole Foods. I've had this card for several years now. There's no annual fee. The, there are no foreign transaction fees. It's a pretty good card, and with every purchase, I get points that can can be used toward purchases at Amazon.com. They show up when I'm checking out, and if I've got a little balance from the card, I, I get to take some money off of a purchase, and that doesn't build up that quickly. But every once in a while, it's a nice little uh, bargain that shows up in my shopping basket. Darlene has a rewards card with Southwest Airlines, so we're going to have to remember to use my Amazon card when we shop at Whole Foods to get that full 5% reward. Unlike the Whole Foods store in downtown Denver, the closest Whole Foods to us here in Cambridge does not have a pop-up store selling Amazon devices. Not yet, at least. Another thing worth waiting for may be a new category of board games enhanced by the constantly expanding innovation on the Alexa platform. Mashable this week reported on a company named Sensible Object that plans to introduce When in Rome, the first board game to incorporate Alexa. Through your Echo device, Alexa will teach you the rules of the game, keep track of the score, and guide you through the play. Players sit around a map of various cities. As your marker enters a city, Alexa asks you questions about that city's weather, customers, food, etc. You earn points by answering correctly, and the player with the most points at the end wins. The game is the first installment in something called Voice Originals, an upcoming series of voice augmented tabletop games that uh, this sensible object uh, company is introducing. When in Rome is expected to launch this summer for $29.95. I have reached out to them to see if I can arrange an interview, maybe a review copy of the game. It might be just the ticket for entertaining grandchildren on a rainy day up in Ocean Park, Maine this summer. Uh, finally, in news, I want to... Your Echo received an important update and must restart. It'll be ready again shortly. Well, that's inconvenient. I pressed the button, so I've got the red ring there, but she interrupted the show just to say that she's updating. This is an older Echo that I have here in the uh, recording closet. It's going to be updated, and I'm going to be talking to her a little later. Oh, I'm going to be demonstrating something that John Aga told me about. So, uh, last item in news, uh, I want to play you an excerpt from the Financial Times Tectonic podcast. That's a really terrific show I've started listening to lately about uh, technology and society. This week's episode of the show is a replay. I don't know how old the original interview was, but it was with Yuval Noah Harari, the author of two best-selling, really highly praised books, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, and Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow. John Thornhill, the FT's innovation editor, that's a great job title, had a wide-ranging and intelligent conversation with Harari that included the author's suggestion that we may be approaching a time in history when algorithms controlled by independent entities, governments, companies, will know more about us than we know about ourselves. Let's take books as an example. Previously, if you wanted to choose what book to read, in the age of the traditional religions, you would ask the priest, and the priest would say, read the Bible, obviously. And then came humanism and told us, just go to a bookshop, start flipping through books, and just follow your feelings and emotions, and choose whatever book seems to you most interesting. Now you go online and Amazon recommends books to you on the basis of its algorithms that get to know your reading habits. When you read a book, say, on Kindle, already today, Kindle is gathering information on you at the same time that you're reading the book. It can know which pages you read fast and which slow, when you stopped reading the book and never came back to it. Now you can connect Kindle even today to face recognition algorithms so that the Kindle will know, the book will know, not only if you read fast or slow, but also start understanding your emotional reactions. If you're smiling, if you're sad, if you're bored. Within 5-10 years, you'll be able to connect Kindle to biometric sensors that monitor your heart rate, your blood pressure, activities in, in the brain. 
And with this kind of technology, Kindle, which means Amazon, will be able to know exactly what was the emotional impact of every sentence you read in the book. And whereas we forget most of what we read, Amazon will never forget anything. Based on this information, it will be able not just to recommend books, it will basically be able to recommend everything. That is a provocative vision, and the issues of privacy, of course, are central. Uh, is the information aggregated so it's used that way? That's be very different than if I thought Amazon really could tell what I want. But they already do that now by recommending the books that I want based on what other people who read books like I do are reading. I won't have time to uh, decouple all of that, but I have a, had a feeling that a lot of you would enjoy just hearing that bit of speculation. It also maybe we want to put those two books that he's written uh, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, and Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, uh, a lot higher on my to-be-read list than they've been uh, up until I actually heard his voice in this interview. Uh, you're going to hear John Aga in the interview talk about how Alexa can check traffic for you. Here is the follow-up note that he emailed to me on how to do this. This is after we recorded the interview. He writes, I checked and the Alexa traffic skill is found within the settings menu of the Alexa app. That's the app that you'd have on your iPhone or your Android phone. Step one, open the Alexa app. Step two, open settings and scroll down to Alexa preferences. Step three, select traffic and enter your to and from app addresses and now Alexa will respond when you say Alexa how is the traffic okay so I followed those steps and on my Alexa app I entered our home here in Cambridge and the location of a place where I drive to meetings several times each week during the mor morning rush hour so let's try it we'll turn her back on now that she's got her update you know I have to say that strikes me as poor user interface if I take the time to turn off my Alexa, so I'm not going to hear her, uh, and then I'm going to get uh, notice of a notification just bursting into whatever uh, the sense of quiet that I created by doing that. Uh, uh, that doesn't seem right to me, so I would urge that to be something that's tweaked. Yes, update me fine. Maybe uh, tell me that it's been updated after it's been updated. The next time I don't put it on mute, but don't just interrupt a recording session for... <laughs> <laughs> a famous podcast. All right. I think I've overreacted to that enough. But let's turn it back on. Alexa, what's the traffic? Right now, traffic on your commute looks a bit slow. The fastest route takes about 13 minutes via US 3 and Route 2. There you have it. Could be handy. As we approach episode 500 of the Kindle Chronicles, I feel as if there should be a medallion that I could offer to those of you who have listened to every single show. One would go to John Aga of Cottage Grove in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota, who is my guest for this week's interview. When we connected by Skype on Wednesday this week, there was a temperature difference of 53 degrees between here in Cambridge, Mass., and Cottage Grove. Uh, Darlene and I had been out biking on the Minuteman Bikeway to Lexington, enjoying, enjoying a high of 71 degrees, while the Mercury was stuck at 18 degrees in Minneapolis, St. Paul. I began by asking John to tell us about his 31-year career working at the Department of Defense. I initially started out with U.S. Customs, uh, doing inspections of uh, mail shipments uh, coming into the country for to support various U.S. laws, food safety, drug smuggling, copyright infringement, all sorts of things. Then I discovered this agency called Defense Investigative Service, which was tasked with doing background investigations on people who needed security clearances for the Department of Defense. And that could be military, civilian, and contractor employees. And I did that for 26 years until I retired. And so you've been retired now for a few years? A few years now. Yeah. You're about four years younger than I am. I'm glad you're to see that you are also retired. Well, I'll tell you, uh, at the end, we got transferred to another agency, and you might say the culture changed, and it became less fun and meaningful. And in retrospect, it probably saved my life retir retiring when I did, because I covered um, 19 counties of central Wisconsin, and it was a lot of remote areas and rural. About three years ago, I had a heart attack. 
And if I'd had that heart attack when I was in a lonely road in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, I may not have had the good outcome that I did. Oh, my. Because when I had it, I was home. I was on the operating table in under 60 minutes and had a good result. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. So I figured I'd say, yes, I retired earlier than I probably would under normal circumstances, but in retrospect, I think it saved my life. So I'm not going to complain. No, no, I think your timing was impeccable. Well, now, and you have uh, been a reader ever since uh, second grade. Uh, what were the types of books when you were a young reader that most fascinated you? I, I, I think I, even then I had... Um, a taste for the fantastic. Uh, I think some of the things I mentioned to you are like the Phantom Tollbooth. Um, I even recall there was a series of books that one of your uh, interviews uh, talked about when he was younger. They took place in a farm, talking animals. The lead animal was Freddy the Pig. And this was a line of stories that go back, I think, to the 50s and early 60s. And I think that was one of the early... Uh, influencers. And then in the 60s, you were reading science fiction, fantasy, Robert Heinlein. Yeah, Robert Heinlein was one of my favorites. Uh, he wrote a series, what we, what he called then the juveniles. And now today we would probably call YA or young adult fiction. And a couple of my favorites, one was Starship Troopers, about a young man who goes into service and what that is from a kind of a science fiction environment standpoint. And the other one that I put down, I think, for your attention, which was a favorite of mine, and then I shared many years later with my youngest son, was uh, Tunnel in the Sky. It, uh, it's also a science fiction environment where they have found a way, basically, to create shortcuts or a tunnel that allow you to go hundreds of light years to other stars. And, and with it, you don't use rocket ships or flying saucers or anything like that. And it, it's so routine that for field trips, kind of like outward bound, uh, they would send graduating senior classes to what would be safer planets. They could only bring with them what they could carry in a backpack, and they had to survive on the land for a few days. Well, in the story, something goes wrong, and that tunnel collapses because of a, a nova, a supernova or something, an exploding star in the area. It, it breaks the connection, so to speak. And these high school students are on their own for several years, and it's about their surviving before they finally uh, reestablish that connection at the end of the book. And who's that one by? Is that Heinlein? That's also Robert Heinlein. Yeah. I didn't know that he had written juvenile novels. I, what's the one that I read that Stranger in a Strange Land? And the term grok about understanding fully something. I can always tell if someone in my generation says they grok something, I, I know exactly that they're, we're, we're in a similar cohort. <laughs> and that's where it came from. It's a great term. I mean, something about it is so, I mean, you understand some things, but you grok some things at some kind it's of a deeper a simple level. simple one syllable word. Yeah, yeah. And he he invented it, I think, didn't he? Yes, he did. Also, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis. Now, you mentioned The Phantom Tollbooth. I'm not familiar with that one. That's by Norman Juster with illustrations by Jules Pfeiffer. What's that about? Oh, that's just brilliant. And if you really love words and playing with words, it's about a, a, young, a young boy who is incredibly bored with life. You know, he's like, what do you want to do? I'm bored. He just goes hour and hour and day after day, just totally bored, when this mysterious package comes into his room one day. And when he opens it up, there's a toll booth. And the toll booth takes him to this other land where they basically, the magic is in the words and the numbers. And so he goes on a series of adventures in this land where they're constantly playing with words and numbers to create different realities. Wow. Extre and the, and the Jules Pfeiffer is a great illustrator yeah. and there it's just, it's just brilliant. If you love words, you'll love the book and it doesn't matter how young or how old you are. What do you remember most about the Hardy boys? Well, the Hardy boys, one, I had a big box of Hardy boy books and I just, there weren't a lot of books like that. The Hardy Boys, from my generation, that's where a lot of adventure stories came from, about people like me doing mysterious, exciting things. And so, yeah, the Hardy Boys was an early stimulus for later interest and love of, like, thrillers or political spy novels and that sort of thing. But I, I give Hardy Boys a lot of credit. 
And fast forward more to contemporary interest, uh, Daniel Silva. Uh, yeah, I think I've read one of his. Is it, he has a whole series? Are they all about the same character? There's by this point fourteen or fifteen books in the series. The first book in the series, I forget, I'm blanking out on the title, but it was something assassin, and he thought it was going to be a standalone novel. But who's going to make a series about a guy who goes around killing people? But uh, the character is referred to as a, an assassin with a conscience by Mossad after the Munich massacre to join a team of people who is going to go after the people who committed that deed. And so he had been a young artist and he got plucked out of that life and they made him into he was a, an assassin on the team. There are other people that had other things they did. And he did that for three years, and uh, yeah, and that was the that was the uh, that was his backstory. He then retired from it. He huh. became an art restorer. He then lost his son. His wife was uh, permanently injured uh, from a bomb attack, and uh, he went on to occasionally be used by the Mossad for special assignments. But he always went back to his love of painting, which he expressed through doing restorations for different people. So after the initial mission, uh, tracking down the killers uh, from that Olympic terrorist act, he's tracking the down premises, other he's bad hired. guys. And that's uh, each book yeah, is a different. Um, in, in one way, they're capers. They're, um, he'll use art to end the assignment where he'll use somebody – who has an interest in art or a particular painting as a way to get in to see somebody. I see. And um, in some ways, they're, they're a spy novel. And yes, there's gunfire, but there's an awful long process in the story about uh, setting up a backstory, getting somebody's interest so that they can get into their world and get to them or get to information or things that they have. Yeah. So it's, uh, it, I also enjoy the books because they give a, a, a strong sense of place in his descriptions of different places in the world he goes. And the other thing I like about it is it's not your typical U.S. centric spy thriller. It's really looking at the world from the point of view of a different country with a different agenda. And so that seeing it through a different set of eyes is also very interesting. Yeah. You also have a, a passion for American history. And this is someone you recommended to me uh, long mm -hmm. ago. I remember Rick, Rick Atkinson, uh, particularly a compelling writer about World War II. Yes, very much. It's uh, three books. It's called the Liberation Trilogy. The first book is takes place during the um, invasion of North Africa and our first experiences with fighting on the ground in World War II. We, we had a lot to learn. We were pretty green. Uh, the second book covers the invasion of Sicily and Italy. And then the third book is D-Day to the End of the War. Um, I think it might have been in the first book, and I couldn't quote you the exact person in the book who said it, but after a series of, of very intense, traumatic experiences, finally resulting in him being wounded and being shipped home, uh, at, at the end of his part of the story, he was telling the, um, the officer made a promise to himself he was going to spend the rest of his life forgetting what he experienced. It was that traumatic and that intense. And I, that determination to forget was very uh, moving. You know, because you meet so many people. My dad was in World War II. He served in the Navy on Guam. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife's father served in Europe. And you don't hear them talking about their experiences. It's not something they share, trying perpetually to forget. Now, that one looks like it, you can get a box set of those three books uh, yeah, for Kindle. Yeah, I think they would bundle them all three together. You can buy each one individually, or you can get it as a bundle through as on paperback, hardback, or on Kindle. Yes. How about Audible? Do you listen to many audiobooks uh, via Audible? Uh, I, I do a few, and that's where I, I also listed one of my favorites, which is a train or the train to Crystal City. Uh, really tells an aspect of 
the war from the home front. It's about a family internment camp. It's the only family internment camp that existed during World War II. And it housed both Japanese, Italian, and German prisoners and their families. And what was also unique about that prison camp was that's where prisoners went that FDR was using to trade for our people who were stranded in different countries controlled by the um, by the Nazis and by the Japanese. Now, in my time, when I lived in Wyoming, Heart Mountain was uh, a place that everybody knew about. I, I had pictured that families were interned there, but the, is this one about Heart Mountain? The, no, this one is in Crystal City, Texas. Huh, interesting. Now, there might have been other families, but this one was was really was all families yeah. as far as I could tell from the way they were telling the story. Um, one of the heart wrenching examples, they were really cut off the people that were being held there. They didn't know how the war was going good or bad. And there was two families in particular they featured. One was Japanese and one was German. And it must've been towards maybe the last year of the war. And each one had to that point had avoided by circumstance being shipped back to Japan or Germany for American or other allied prisoners. And so when they each went, they thought they were going to a country that was winning the war in their mind. And the reality of what they were walking into when they discovered the devastation both in Japan and Germany was heart-wrenching. And it took many years for, like the parents were still, they were, they were like holding, holders of green cards. Their children were U.S. citizens, but the children were of an age that they couldn't say no to their parents and say, I'm going to go independent and I'm staying here. They didn't have that kind of emotional strength, or in some cases, they had age. And so they got dragged with their parents to war zones. Wow. Is this historical fiction or, or nonfiction? Nonfiction. Wow. So these are actual accounts of real families. These are actual accounts, real people. Yeah. Very moving. I can see why someone who is as passionate a reader as you are would be drawn to e-readers when they first surfaced. And your first e-reader was not a Kindle. It was a Nook, a very heavy Nook. And it was clunky and it was slow in its response. But it was uh, I got that was my first taste of e-reading and I liked it. And then when the Kindle keyboard came along, I jumped for that. Um, I like the keyboard. I like that I'm a tactile person. I like the fact that it supported audio. Um, I could um, do text to speech with it in addition to uh, just reading the book straight. I think I had mentioned, might have mentioned to you that and it was also a way that I caught up with your podcast. I love that. <laughs> I would download the podcast to the Kindle keyboard, and I would periodically be playing those at faster than one a week so that I could catch up with everybody else. <laughs> That's great. So the Kindle keyboard, that was the third generation, wasn't it? There was the original and the Kindle That was the third Kindle generation too. Kindle. Yeah. yeah. That was a classic, and it was very sleek. I remember seeing the first one. One of the Amazon execs brought one to a sh uh, demo in Boston. He pulled it out of his coat pocket, and, man, I thought that was just the most modern, terrific-looking Kindle I could imagine. And I liked the page-turn buttons on it. They That's were right. real page-turn buttons, yeah. not the haptic sensor things that buzz a little bit, which mm. just aren't as satisfying as a real button. So my ideal Kindle would have uh, real buttons and would have audio support so that you could do immersion reading along with just straight reading. Now, the immersion reading, that's where we can uh, listen to an actual professional reader read a book as each word is highlighted. So those are only available on the Fire or an iPad. You can't do immersion reading on... Or, or an Android device that has right. uh, support immersion reading too. So for instance, right now I've got one that I've just started about the making of Casablanca. Oh, the movie. And I've got, yeah, about uh -huh. the making of the movie. The author, in the, in the first few pages of it, the author uh, wins a small inheritance, so I think $10,000, and uh, we would call it bucket list. He's always wanted to go on a cruise and picks 1939 to go on a cruise to Europe. <laughs> This is before the war started, Oops. so it's yeah. like 38, late 38 or early 39. And he discovers that things aren't as idyllic as he thinks, and he has family that's still trapped there. He's Jewish, who are using him to smuggle possessions out. 
And uh, during the course of his visit to Europe, he runs across, I think it's in Lisbon, he runs across a, 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 a saloon that would resemble the one in Casablanca, the movie, and it had a black piano player who also sang. Wow. The inspiration again for the movie. And he turned to his 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 wife, who was uh, accompanying him on the trip, and he said, "This would make a great uh, play." <laughs> and he started on that, and yeah, within a year or so, he had written the the play Casablanca. Wow! I wonder if he pictured Humphrey Bogart in it. That would have been. No, I haven't gone to that part yet as far as who he'd like to see star in it. But uh, his the inspiration came from a trip to Europe just before the war started. I wonder if he actually heard anybody say round up the usual suspects. Yeah. I'm not sure where that came from, but again, I'm early in the book. Yeah, well, that's, I love the immersion reading. Sometimes I, I used to work out at an athletic club across the street from us in Denver. And so just because it was so busy there, if I was reading a book and I had ear pods on, uh, it helped me to follow if I was doing the immersion reading because I was seeing it and I was hearing it. And you mentioned that you prefer when you're reading nonfiction history. Is it the same thing that it's sort of drawing you tight, more tightly into the story? Or The facts are coming into me from two different ways. Right. One from my eyes, yep. which is one way to learn, and one way through our ears. And I feel like each reinforces the other. Yeah. And I, I, and I also thought that in case of things like history – uh, where you're not reading a fiction story and you're and you and you get to use your mind to f- color it. When it's history, it's more like you're in a really great classroom with a really great professor who's good at telling stories that are true. Mm. And so I don't feel like in that case the narrator is taking me out of the book if I don't see the story the same way the narrator sees it. So yeah, I think it works better for nonfiction than fiction. And the quality of the, of the narrator really makes a difference. So some of these Audible books have such powerful narrators that oh, yes. uh, you're, you're really getting the, boast of, the best of both worlds. Exactly. Sometimes I'll catch a place in uh, an immersion reading where what I'm hearing in Audible is slightly different than what's on the page. That, that I've they... run into that, too, from time to time, where they phrase the sentence. I mean, they're saying the same thing, but they drop one word and maybe put a different word instead. Yeah. Or, yeah, so I've run into the same thing. And that's a little jarring when that happens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You are reading some on, it looks like a Fire HD 10, and yes. also on your voyage. What types of things do you tend to read on uh, those two platforms on on i do most of my extended reading on the voyage it's easy on the eyes it's like reading a page off a book except i have control over the appearance of the page and i've had the voyage since it came out about three years ago and haven't felt compelled it still works great so Mm -hmm. have you uh Try it out in Oasis at a pop-up store or any, anywhere that you might have run across one? have not been to a, a pop-up store where they had an Oasis, but I wouldn't mind. Uh, uh, maybe, I don't know, I've heard that they uh, display Kindles and Echoes at some of the Whole Foods stores, and we do have one here in town, so I should check that and, yeah. and see if we have one I can get my hands on. But we we don't have a – I'd love to get a an Amazon bookstore in the Twin Cities. I think we have plenty of readers in Minnesota. It's so. surprising there isn't one. I, there's rumors of one coming to Denver, and uh, I would think Minneapolis would be pretty high on the list. seems like a pretty bookish town. Yeah, you could uh, bring home a, an oasis with your, your kale and your, your uh, avocado someday from That's Whole Foods. Right. Look what followed me home, dear. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't on the list. Yeah. Do you have uh, – I've turned her off so I can say her name. Do you have uh, – is your home have uh, Alexa capability? Oh, yes. I've got um, – in fact, I better turn this mine off too. Hold on. There we go. Oops. There we go. Okay. Uh, yes, I have a, a dot here in the uh, – it's like an office guest bedroom uh, where I have the computer. And we have one in the bedroom, makes a great alarm clock and something to fall asleep to yeah. if you have something playing in the background. Or And then we have the original Echo out in the living room, mm. when I, I, which I got 
as a beta tester back when before they were rolling it out. Really? How did how did you end up being a beta tester for it? I just got an invite saying, "Would you like to be a beta tester and we will sell it to you not for $199, but for $99." Wow. What yeah. uh, was a pretty organized in terms of the the sorts of information they wanted to get from you after you had tried it? It's uh, you got a script and you ans asked it to do things or asked questions of it. I remember to to get it tuned to your voice, mm -hmm. and it's only gotten better over time. I, one of the features I like is that it will read to you. You can say, "Read me." Uh, a certain book from the Kindle library, and then you get Alexa reading it, yeah. which is which is a better voice than the one on the Amazon Fire tablet. It's a it's a it's a, a more natural sounding voice than the one you get the if text you to ask voice. Yeah. The, the text to speech voice on the Amazon Fire. Yeah. yeah. And of course, it'll also do Audible books if you ask it. So yeah. my wife uses it for uh, one of one of the enabled skills is uh, traffic. So she has a, a occasional trip across the metro to uh, Golden Valley, which is a good 45 to 60 minute drive from our house. And so she can ask Alexa, what's the traffic? And mm. you can you can set up Alexa to do a specific route a from and a to. And then it'll tell you how long your trip would be. And if there's any, um, <laughs> it's it's gone off in another room. It oh. heard <laughs> out of the living room. <laughs> yeah. She's listening everywhere. Uh, it, it, she's everywhere. <laughs> I hadn't heard about that. Do you know? remember the name of that skill? That, or is it just traffic? I think it's probably enable traffic. Yeah, yeah. Or something like that. That would be useful. I probably could look on my tablet maybe for enabled skills. Yeah, see. yeah. I'll look yes, it up and I think, add it to the show notes. I think it would be simple. And you can set it up through the app, I think, as far as you give it a from address and mm -hmm. a to address. Huh. And you do it under the traffic yeah. skill. And it must be yeah. pulling down real-time traffic information from the Internet as part of the It sure sounds like it, yeah. Yeah, huh. yeah it's impressive. They just keep making it smarter and smarter. Well, let's finish up. Uh, I know that you also get books from your local library to read on Kindle. And so that's the uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul library system, or is it a whole statewide system? How, how big is uh, we're, the network? We're a county library system. Mm -hmm. So I'm in Washington County in Minnesota. And so um, I could sign up to get books through OverDrive, and that's the, the Libby is interesting because um, you can do both read through the app, you could hear audible books through the app, but you can, in settings, tell Libby that you want to read it through Kindle. And so then Libby will download it to your Kindle. Now, Libby is a standalone uh, OverDrive app for iTunes and Android? Yes. It's uh, it is uh, for both the Android and iTunes, uh, Apple. I'm not sure if there are any other platforms. Maybe Microsoft. It'll work for them too. They have a version, but I know it is for Android and Apple. Now, what is yourcloudlibrary.com? That's another way to access your library books. Yes, that one also handles eBooks and Audible books. And that one is only available, like Libby. Libby and, uh, and the Cloud Library app are only available through Android or iTunes. I see. Overdrive and the other one that I referenced with you. RB Digital. That manages e or audiobooks and magazines. So hmm. you can download uh, high graphic intensive magazines and read them on your tablet. Is that by OverDrive or that's just a, another provider? No, it's not. That's not OverDrive. Libby and OverDrive are both by the OverDrive parent mm -hmm. company. Right. And I'm not sure who RB Digital is mm -hmm. affiliated with, but they're they're a, a separate entity. Only only RB Digital and OverDrive are available in the Amazon App Store. Now, I, I only learned about the other apps by talking to my librarian that, that oh. there were other apps that even existed. Well, that's a savvy librarian that can point you to these tools. The other thing that's interesting is, and I'm not sure, this is a question I'd, I'd hoped you could have asked when you were with the American Library Association, but I find that there's a book in OverDrive that's not in the Cloud Library app and vice versa. 
It's like they're each managing portions of the of the entire collection, and I'm not sure what that is. They, maybe they have to do with different contracts. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the library buys a different set of books from each of them. Yeah. Huh. I'm I'm pleased because it. I remember five years ago when I first started covering Overdrive. Uh, it seemed a little tentative as to whether the publishers were really going to make books available. And yeah. just in that brief talk uh, uh, at the ALA meeting, it just seems like there's no turning back now that the publishers are totally accepting that uh, it makes sense for them to make their books available in ebook format yeah. libraries. I've got several books on hold audible books on hold through the cloud library app some of them say this will be available in 21 days 45 days 180 days oh, so they tell you exactly how long you're going to wait <laughs> they'll tell you how long it's going to be and uh yeah and then they just show up yeah and then they just go away at the end of three weeks did they give you any kind of a, a message that uh you better finish this book because it's going to disappear in three days Yes, I'll get an email message that uh, it's available in three days. Uh, the the advantage of of um, getting the book onto my Kindle is that if I'm close to finishing a book and I'm running up on the deadline, I'll just turn the wireless off <laughs> and go. And it's like run silent, run deep. <laughs> You you could keep it as long as you want, as long as you don't go onto the network. As long as I don't turn the wireless back on, and it'll then it'll suck it out of the of the device. <laughs> <laughs> well, you uh, certainly seem to be an active reader. You're you're not a highlighter. I think I saw you. You no, it's never interested me. I've never uh, felt any compulsion. I guess I have more in common with your wife that uh, she likes reading, but has no real com. com- you know, compelled to yeah. uh, highlight in any way. Well, I think I'm impressed at how much you remember about these books that we've talked about. It may be that you have no need to highlight because once it goes through <laughs> your eyes into your mind, it's pretty accessible just right there. I do like reading and I do seem to have a knack for remembering at least a decent amount from it years <laughs> later. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Well, since you have listened right from the start of the podcast, do you, do you, and I'm coming up on number... 500 soon. 500, yeah. Is 500 the next one? It's, I think maybe it is. I think we might be, we're doing this for 499, and next week I've got 500. What's your sense of what we're doing here, and why is this compelling and worth doing another 500 shows for? I feel like you're taking us along on a journey, and we're getting to share it and it, it's it's like a lot of things often having someone to share the journey with makes the journey that much more special and i think that's something that you bring with the kindle chronicles is you're bringing us along on this journey and sharing it together as a group that's how i feel i mean that's why i don't i'm not tempted to uh uh, well, you know, when I come up on a number like 500, I'll have to admit sometimes I think, isn't that enough? You know, and I'm 67 and, but the pull of doing a journey like this with other people, uh, and hearing from them, it, it, there's a, there's an energy energy there, which I will have to overcome anytime I decide, you know, the 600th yeah. show is enough or whatever. <laughs> Plus I have that commitment. I want to interview Jeff Bezos when he turns 80 to ask if he has any regrets. I'm thinking that one might be done on a rocket ship somewhere. There you go. <laughs> um, but you know, you, you have the passion and you transmit that passion to your listeners. And uh, as long as you're having fun, I assume we're going to have fun too. I think you're right. I have been speaking with John Aga, a longtime listener to the Kindle Chronicles from Cottage Grove, Minnesota. Thanks very much, John. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk with you. You will find links to all the books that John mentioned under the content in this week's show notes at thekindlechronicles.com. My guest next week will be Kevin Keith, Amazon's general manager for Fire Tablets, Kindle, and Echo Alexa product marketing. That Google Voice number, again, if you want to leave a message for the 500th show, is 617-807-0205. Instead of the usual outro music, I'm going to leave you with the opening to the first episode of this podcast, TKC1, released to the Internet on July 26, 2008. I want to thank all of you who've listened uh, for uh, over the years, and it's kind of fun to hear how this started and to realize a lot of the essence of 
what I've been doing in these last 500 shows was captured in the that first uh, show that I put up at the cottage in Ocean Park, Maine. Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles, a podcast about the Kindle. This is episode one. I'm Len Edgerly, and this is a new podcast that I'm creating. In addition to two other podcasts I have, the Audio Pod Chronicles and the Video Pod Chronicles, my idea was, uh, since I'm such a huge fan and enthusiast of the Kindle, to do a weekly podcast all about the Kindle that would comprise uh, some news, a tech tip, an interview with a fellow Kindle enthusiast, and then maybe some final thoughts about something that I'm reading on the Kindle. I have it set up uh, as a website. You can find that guy started talking about the Kindle 500 episodes ago, and so far he just hasn't stopped. Thanks for listening.